This episode is presented by Fleet Feet. We need more educators. We need more BIPOC outdoor educators. That is, that's another reason I'm, these certifications are important to me. Um, a lot of people do not feel comfortable and don't want to be in an educational, outdoor educational experience that's white-led. Mm -hmm. They just don't feel comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And we have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. It's not my experience. I don't understand it, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter mm -hmm. if I understand it or not. My name is Allison Mariella Desir, and this is Out and Back, a podcast exploring how Black, Indigenous, and other people of color are reclaiming space in the outdoors. Each episode, you'll hear their stories, and we'll get outside with them in their element, which may not always be my element. We're headed to a lake outside of Seattle with Denise Rochelle, the founder and director of the Bronze Chapter. The Bronze Chapter is an organization all about giving Black, Indigenous, and other people of color the experiences and skills necessary to get outside. Denise wants us to rewrite our outdoor narrative to create better stewards of the land. We're going to talk, and she's going to share some kayaking skills. I've never solo kayaked before, so I'm excited and a little nervous. I can swim, but in a very loose sense of the word. If you want to see Denise and I having our talk and adventure, check out our video series. There's a link to it in the show notes, or you can find it at crosscut.com slash video. Hi, Denise. Hi. Thank you for joining me. I'm excited to chat with you and learn more about who you are and what you do. So could you start by, um, yeah, let's say, tell me your name, where you're, where you're born and raised. My name is Denise Rochelle. And I was raised in uh, Seattle, and um, I lived on South Capitol Hill. And then when I was very young, we moved to Kirkland, when mm. Kirkland was still country. Mm. I don't even know. I've seen signs for Kirkland. <laughs> I don't it's know anything about it. It's on the east side. Okay. Um, and would you say, like, growing up, what was your experience like in terms of being in the outdoors? Did you always do outdoor things? I, I don't remember not having outdoor experience. That's what I know. Hmm. You know, that that's your story is unique from many of the stories I tell on this show and many of the folks that folks and organizations I'm working with where part of what led them to start an organization was because they didn't see themselves in the outdoors or they felt this um, disconnection from the outdoors. But that's not your story, right? A little bit. A little bit it is. Um, I didn't see myself mm. obviously outdoors especially when i moved to kirkland because that's it was a very predominantly white city we were maybe one of the only two or three people of color in the whole city mm. at the time um, so that definitely was a part of why i started this because i very selfishly wanted to recreate with more people who look like me mm. I've never been afraid of the outdoors. I think that's mm, the that's, big distinction. I've mm. never felt separated from it. I've never felt other people didn't want me there. You mentioned that your parents, one is white, one is black. Um, and your father in the 1970s was like such an outdoorsman. I'd love if you could share some memories you have of <laughs> your, your father in the outdoors. It was. Well, it was very unusual because he was born in the early 40s when you know, he still couldn't go to some mm. pools he, in Louisiana where he was born. He, there's a lot of things he couldn't do. He couldn't drink out of white water faucets mm. um, and things like that. So my aunts brought him here in Seattle when he was young. He just took on the Pacific Northwest lifestyle mm. and he apparently just gravitated to it. So when he became an adult, he just connected with people, met mm. people that were doing things that he thought would be fun to do and all white. Mm. and began hanging out with them and doing it. Mm. So he, he was an excellent scuba diver and he was oh, wow. spear fishing and he just took up water skiing and he was an excellent slalom skier. Wow. And so, you know, I grew up with boats and skiing and, and motorcycle riding, riding dirt bikes and wow. camping and fishing, uh, Did riding you bicycles. <laughs> Did you ever get a sense from him that um, he felt, like how did he grapple with being the only in these spaces or did he share about the discomfort or any fear that he might have had? 
You know, every now and then he would make some comment about that. Yeah. But for the most part, I think my gut is that he, it didn't bother him. He did not let the social situation or the conditions, the environment keep him from doing any of those things. Hmm. So he's a lot like you. You're a lot like him. I'm a lot like him, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so tell, wow. me, tell me about the story of the Ron Shaft or how it came to be. The name came to be, um, came from a camp out that we had at Daroga. Mm. It was the first of two of the biggest camp outs that I hosted at Daroga State Park. And one of the uh, participants, a woman who came from New York, mm. um, we were in the bathroom and we were talking and she says, this is like a beautiful Perance chapter. She didn't even remember she said it, mm. but it stuck with me. Those words, you know, I kind of did a double take. I was mm. like, the chapter. It was just, I knew that that had to be the name. Mm. So in 2018, I, I took a road trip to visit a friend in South California, Southern California. And on the way back, I was camping along the way, going to the redwoods, flying kites, doing whatever I was doing. And I never saw anybody else who looked like me, mm. um, male, female, or solo. And I travel a lot solo, and I sure didn't see anybody look like me traveling solo. Mm. And so I just was sitting there in the Redwoods one night, and I lit my fire, and I cracked my beer, and I was like, where is everybody still? Still! It just was bothering me. And so when I got home, I jumped on some socials and asked people in some affinity groups, I'm not running into you mm. and I'm all over the place and and so I said why and people just started sending me their stories all of the comments kind of boiled down to three categories which was um, I don't have opportunity um, I don't know what I'm doing mm. and so I don't have skills and um, I don't want to be doing these things new or rusty in a predominantly white environment mm. and so th those themes were not rocket science mm. you know they were just very simple and it seemed really sad to me mm. that i mean to me these weren't even barriers these were just like connections that hadn't been made mm. um like and i just was talking to my husband and i said well i can do something about every single one of these things and I'm not an outdoor professional I don't have an outdoor education degree but I can do those things mm. and so he said well do it then <laughs> <laughs> I love your husband <laughs> and so I found a campground that was pretty close to my house and I rented it it was a group site and I just started posting opportunities for people to learn to camp mm. you want to come learn to camp you know, or do you want to come, if you're rusty, relearn, you know, get familiar with your stuff. And if you're a seasoned camper, do you want to come lend your spirit to the space? I love that. And that's how, that was literally the first camp out that I hosted. And it was 12 people there. And, um, and I just kept doing it. One thing led to another, led to another, led to another. Then the pandemic came and I didn't do a whole lot. Wasn't a lot happening. And then people started sending me messages saying, you know, we want to do something. Well, what are you doing? So I looked at some campgrounds that I thought would be neat, um, that I hadn't been to before, that would be neat, I have some criteria, beautiful, you know, educational with a water proximity. And I found Daroga. I hadn't been there before. It had always been on my radar. And so I checked it out and I was hesitant because it was going to cost me almost $1,000 to rent that for a long weekend. The spaces filled up that were allowed. I rented it the next weekend. So then I was 2,000 bucks in and I was like, this is scary now, yeah. right? <laughs> it was scary before, but now it's really scary. And it was, it was amazing. So it was the, they were the biggest camp outs I'd hosted up to that date. Um, it was about a hundred BIPOC that camped in those two weekends, which was a lot for me. And um, you know, somebody, like I told you that woman came from Somebody came from New York, and somebody came from San Francisco, and people came just from different places. And I just knew that there was a space for this, for what mm. I was trying to do, mm. um, even though it seemed very, you know, modest um, and easy. Mm. 
I said, well, I can keep doing this, but now I, I want to do more things. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to just see people camping. I want to ski with people, water ski. I want to snow ski with people. I want to snowboard with people. I want to kayak with people. I want to ride my bike with people. You know, I want to see other solo people, especially women, especially mm -hmm. BIPOC women, out when I'm traveling on road trips and mm -hmm. stuff. And so I knew I needed to do something more with a strong educational component. Mm -hmm. And I just blindly went for it. <laughs> I, I mean, I love that. I <laughs> Have you always been a person who sees something and realizes I can do something about it and jumps in? Because not everybody does, right? Mm, people, no. lots of people see an issue and are like, nope, <laughs> no, <laughs> that well, sucks. I'm not loud. Mm. I don't get a lot of attention because I'm not loud. I'm mm. not controversial. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty apolitical. Mm -hmm. um, so there's not a lot about me that gets a lot of attention. Mm. So I was thinking, well, can I, am I the person to do this, you know? Mm. Do I have the personality that can pull this off? Mm. That was really the thing that I thought more about than um, than actual doing the thing. Mm. I just knew I wanted to do it. Other people wanted it, mm. and nobody else was doing it. Mm. So I said, I can do it, mm. and so I did it. Mm. I'm trying to do it. I'm still trying to do it. You are doing it. I'm so grateful for what you're doing because I was just on the internet looking for stuff to do. I moved from New York a year and a half ago, so I'm used to seeing black and brown people everywhere. And then I see this thing, the bronze chapter, and the name was really enticing. I'm like, this has to be something for me. <laughs> um, so I see this Sweet. amazing bioluminescence tour, and I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be this like glass bottom boat. <laughs> We're all going to get it together. And then I missed one crucial word, paddle. It was there, didn't even register. So I, we showed up with my husband, and my husband and I showed up, and my husband gets out first to like check things out, and he comes back and he's like, you're not gonna like this. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, it sounds awesome. He's like, we are in double kayaks. <laughs> so I was like, oh my gosh. But what was so cool is everybody there was awesome. It was the most diverse group of people I've been around since being in Washington really? State. Really? Yeah. Wow. And um, there were folks of all different levels. So we went paddling at night in the ocean <laughs> for my first trip ever. Yeah. That's what it's about. It's experience. Mm -hmm. You had that experience. And from that experience, you probably feel more confident. Absolutely. Yeah. And I want to do everything. <laughs> See? I mean, it's just... It's, it's a spark and it's very, very simple. That, that bioluminescence paddle is a special partnership to me because kayaking is inherently a high barrier mm -hmm. activity or sea kayaking, especially with the component of black people in particular not having strong relationships with the water. Yeah. Um, so people come, most people who come on this bioluminescence paddle have never kayaked. So, so they're in a, they're in a kayak, never kayaking before. And what you can see there, you know, you touch bioluminescence, you see it, yeah. you, you create it through your own agitation. Yeah. Those bioluminescence paddles have become such a ramp to other outdoor recreation for people. Yeah, it was, it was also so amazing because I had seen bioluminescence in, in like Disney movies, the princess and the frog, <laughs> there's this scene and like, I didn't really have a recognition that that's a real thing that happens in nature. Yeah, that, right. So then to be able to experience it, and to your point, experience it where there's this level of comfort around people who look like you, people who may have had similar experiences because we look like you know each mm -hmm. other. Um, I wanted to go back to something that you mentioned just briefly about black people and their relationship to water. And I had read a recent statistic that I think it's like 58% of black people don't know how to swim, which is twice the statistic for white people. That sounds about right. And it's both shocking and not. <laughs> okay. And they and black drownings in King County ac account for most of the drown unnecessary drownings. Mm. So it, it is a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal. And I think about, you know, you mentioned how your father grew up in a time when he couldn't swim in public pools, right? So mm -hmm. just this connection between 
historical practices that exist and then where we find ourselves. Yeah, well, well it can't, it's historical racism. That's what prevented the opportunities, the experience, the skills. Mm. So if your grandparents didn't experience it and they didn't teach it to their children, their children teach it to their children, mm. then it doesn't happen. Mm. Um, you, you know, for the most part, it doesn't right. happen. Right. And, you know, we're seeing that here, especially in the Pacific Northwest. We have water everywhere. Yeah. Lakes, rivers, streams, the sea. Um, and people around here need to know how to be safe in the water. And that's just my opinion. Mm. And um, having that skill opens up a whole huge, mm. just plethora of opportunities yeah. you can do here. Kayak, paddleboard, um, surfing. I mean, it just it goes on and on. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we need to be in those spaces. If we don't experience those spaces, we won't have a relationship with those spaces. We won't learn to value those spaces. Yeah. We won't protect those spaces. So then there's the stewardship, preservation, conservation piece that gets missed. Mm. You know, in 20 years when we become a um, predominantly non-white nation, mm. then Who's going to care for these spaces? Hmm. That's a big deal for me in the Bronx chapter. Who's going to care for these spaces? We don't have enough population in these spaces to create policy for them. Wow. We need scientists in the space. Hmm. We need engineers in the space. Hmm. We need educators in the space. And if through some educational, some spark that a Bronx chapter could maybe give that can lead someone to even be interested in that mm. is what I'm hoping because it's really scary for me yeah. to think what's going to happen to all of our public spaces land and marine in the next 20 years yeah when we're not there we're not at the table making policy or caring we're not mm. stewards so mm. then what it is very hard to even get BIPOC out doing trail work Mm. I mean, we have to start so far down. Mm. We have so far to go. Mm. We need to figure it out. That's such a powerful vision. And I love, you know, it's, it, it is about, of course, on the micro level, enjoying it. But it's connected to this much bigger celebration, but also problem that we have to tackle, right? Like this world, resources are finite. And if we're not connected and caring about them, we're really at the mercy of other people. Right. And when those other people are us, mm -hmm. right. then what? Right. Yeah. Stick around. We haven't even gotten to the adventure yet. This episode is presented by Fleet Feet. Fleet Feet believes that running changes everything. We sell the shoes, apparel, and gear you need to get started. And we host fun runs, training groups, and events. Whether you're training for your first mile or your 50th marathon, we're here to run with you. Learn more at fleetfeet.com. There was something that you said, um, what was it, that I want to go back to. Oh, you know, when you started the Bronze Chapter, you shared you had no certifications, right? Like, you were just like, I can solve these things because, you know, anybody with in the outdoors could, but you've since gotten a lot of certifications and I'd love for you to talk about that process, even so recent as getting your woofer certif certification, what that has been like for you. So I've never been, um, you know, like when I do sports, I, I'm just not extreme. I don't feel the need to be the fastest or mm -hmm. go the highest or anything like that. I'm out for my own enjoyment. And so I've never been a collector of degrees mm. or certifications but now you know with the bronze chapter it, it means more mm. I'm presenting myself and hoping other people can look at me mm. and say wow that's kind of inspiring mm. she's doing something different and if she can do it I can do it and also there's a component of when people are with the bronze chapter they need to be taken care of they need to have some kind of level of confidence that mm. if we're out doing something that they have a decent chance of someone being able to help them. Mm, absolutely. So that's what led me to get um, my own Wilderness First Aid certification and host a class where we got 16 BIPOC Amazing. certified with Wilderness First Aid. And then that's what led me to Wilderness First Responder because mm. I can't teach Wilderness First Aid eventually without woofer, right? 
and the same thing with um, with ARI, with avalanche training. And um, I'm going to be getting a Leave No Trace Master Certification, Master Educator Certification pretty soon, and, mm. and um, some Alpine Certification. Because I'm trying to make myself more valuable mm. to my community in mm. so many ways. Mm. And that's, I'm investing in myself, so I have more to give to the people around me. So you, you know, you have all these certifications and it sounds like this is an incredible growing organization, but is the work of one woman. What is your hope for the bronze chapter? So um, I hope the bronze chapter is able to slowly expand its offerings and the people who offer it. I want to see more people who look like us mm. having more varied outdoor experiences in a skilled way. And we, we need more educators. Mm. We need more BIPOC outdoor educators. That is, that's another reason I'm, these certifications are important to me. Um, a lot of people do not feel comfortable and don't want to be in an educational, outdoor educational experience that's white-led. Mm -hmm. They just don't feel comfortable with that. Mm and we have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. It's not my experience. I don't understand it, mm. but it doesn't matter mm. if I understand it or not. That is such an important distinction because I, you know, none of us can understand everybody's lived experience, but this idea of, I mean, empathy and like, that's not my experience, but okay, we need to address it, <laughs> right? There, it's not gonna change if we just pretend that that's not an obstacle for folks. Yeah, there are people who look like me who have more, you know, who have similar experiences to me. Mm -hmm. But we are we're the minority. Mm. Most people don't. And um, more and more white outdoor educators that I meet are understand that, mm. and they are very willing to come into a space and to teach, and you know, be an information sharer mm. and completely honor the space mm. and let what happens hap needs to happen happen and needs to let what needs to be said be said. Mm. And uh, I just I think that's great. So people who come through the brunch chapter, you know, they have that experience and they leave knowing I had a good experience. Mm. That was okay mm -hmm. to me. That's like. Wow, because if everybody had my experience, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Exactly. Because exactly. the world would be full of me, exactly. you know? Seattle would be full of me, and it's not. Mm -hmm. And the flip side of that is that um, it's only happened once, but somebody did make a comment to me that I wasn't black enough mm. to connect with black people outdoors mm. in Seattle. And that kind of that was bizarre mm. and, and didn't expect that but I was like wow mm. that is that's interesting mm -hmm. coming from my own community that perspective mm. and so I know it exists out there that's not mm -hmm. you know maybe it only been said to me one time but um, and that's simply because I I'm you know I'm vocal and pretty open about who I am and they knew I was biracial mm. so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I mean that kind of gatekeeping you know, I never, with gatekeeping, I think about where is the hurt that is creating this kind of behavior, right? This idea of who is, and I get that in different ways being, um, I'm black, but I'm Afro-Latinx, and my mom's Colombian, my father's Haitian, and so in many cases, I'm not black enough, I'm certainly not Latinx enough, mm. right? So I'm like, well, then who the hell am I? <laughs> right? People have asked me this uh -huh. at campouts and stuff. So how is it that I just go places and do things. Mm. I fit in anywhere I go. I get along with everybody. And you go solo. I go, I go solo. I feel comfortable with that. Um, I, and I didn't realize that was not everyone's experience. Mm. I, like it's so normal for me. It's mm. just me. And so then I was thinking, God, I think it's how I grew up. It's, it, it's, it's, it's opportunity. Mm. It's exposure, it's experience. All those things come together to like, you know, make us who we are. That's why exposure, that's why opportunity is so important. Mm. It's just, it makes us who we are. Mm. And when I was young, I grew up, my mm. family had a restaurant. And so 
um, the first Creole restaurant in Seattle. You know, downtown Seattle had, was, was a lively vibe. I mean, ever since I can remember uh, I was little, I grew up with around trans people. Mm. This was back when no, nobody knew what trans people were. Mm -hmm. Trans people, you know, cross dressers, serious 70s pimps and mm. prostitutes and the whole different s section of houseless people. And, and they were my friends. I was always around such different people hmm. that I don't, there is not a situation I can even imagine being in that I wouldn't feel comfortable. Hmm. I just, I just have to, somebody tells me a story, I believe it at face value. Hmm. And I'm like, how do we, how do I, how do we get you to where you want to be hmm. from your own experience? Hmm. Cause they want to feel that they want right. to feel that freedom. Right. And if I can do something about that, I think that would be really cool. Hmm. But yeah, so when I was in elementary school, I would leave class because I was bored and I wasn't feeling like I was wanted really in that environment anyway. So I would just walk outside and go sit under a tree. <laughs> and that was my space. I mean, that hmm. was where I felt comfortable because that wanted me, you know? Hmm. That's beautiful. Even hearing you say that, I'm also hearing your at your sort of advice around taking people's experiences at face value right because for me to hear that you feel comfortable in almost every space I'm like in my head I'm like that's not true that can't be true but it's like that has been your experience and so mm -hmm. um, it's an important lesson um, in encountering difference right that when somebody tells you their experience you believe it you know mm -hmm. yeah well amplify black stories right absolutely believe black stories all of them believe mm -hmm. all of them mm -hmm. yeah we have different experiences mm -hmm. and yeah you have to validate them it is what it is yeah we can never go forward with something if we're holding people back or oppressing them mm -hmm. through their own stories <laughs> right right if we're not if we're not letting their narrative be be the truth right if we're trying to say no it must be the narrative that i know and that makes me feel comfortable or seen. It sounds yeah. right to my ears. Yeah. Because your story sounds like stupid shit to me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, it's like, it's for real. Yeah. You know, so when I say I'm a chameleon, I feel like that. Mm. I am. I don't look at myself and see my color. Mm. People want me to be in a box, want me to have a label. They want me to have a more activist voice. They want me to have more political voice. They want me to all the time label myself as a black woman. Mm. But by doing that, I completely um, ignore my mother mm. who raised me. So there's a, just, just, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. So I'm really fighting to be me in this mm. organization. I'm just mm. me. Mm. Um, I don't have a fight with anybody. Mm. I just want to create a more balanced outdoor recreation scene. And I'm not gonna color my hair like mm. people have asked me to do. Are you kidding? Your hair's amazing. They, they, I've been asked to, uh, I, you should maybe think about coloring your hair, your representational, representational face of the Bronx chapter. If I cover my hair all the way up, I don't get that stuff. Mm. If I wear hats, I don't get that stuff. It's so when people can see my hair, mm. that ageism kicks in. Mm. And all of a sudden, people ask, are curious about how I do something that they weren't curious before. Mm. And so now I have pushback on my own. I'm like, I'm not doing it. Mm. This, is, this is who I am. And maybe if you're inspired by that, because mm -hmm. I'm almost 60 years old, and I'm rocking it. I would not have <laughs> guessed 60. I'm like, you know what? And I can out hike most people I hike with. I can out cycle most people I cycle mm. with. I have good stamina. I have good health. And I'm just like, be you. Yeah. Don't let people stop you. And the media does not serve us well. No. The outdoor media, especially, who doesn't want to put people who look like me mm -hmm. in, in their magazines. You know, I'm not this this box mm -hmm. and this box is not going to save our planet we're not mm -hmm. an affinity organization meaning that we do not only serve the black community mm -hmm. to me we're all in this together mm -hmm. we are all needed 
to learn about and help the environment and be here in these natural spaces. No, I mean, I understand that. I also personally, I think about, you know, that my issue is not with white people. My issue is with white supremacy and systems that have pitted white people against other people, mm -hmm. right? So the issue that we all have to fight against is white supremacy that is creating this space where we're ruining our environment, right? right. Like white people aren't benefiting from that either. <laughs> you know what I mean? I would love if you could tell me the experiences that the Bronze Chapter offers. This year, we've offered a wilderness for, uh, first aid certification class. We've offered a um, women's outdoor self-defense and beyond class. Mm. It was super powerful. Mm. Um, we've hosted campouts where people can come at all skill levels, learn to camp. We've offered a, a kayak foundation. Mm class. Um, I've offered some knot tying classes. Mm. Um, it's been a long year, but it <laughs> doesn't sound like much, but it's been no, full. No, it's been fab. <laughs> it's been full. I want to ask about your shirt. It says, rewrite, rewrite your, your outdoor, outdoor narrative. narrative. Tell me about That's that. That's what we're about. Um, so we all have a story mm -hmm. that is we tell ourselves or that's been told to us and we believe it. I mean, we all have a narrative and that informs how we move mm. and what maybe we try and what we don't try. That whole thing about black people don't swim, black people don't like, uh, don't like cold weather, so we don't, and we're not in doing some no sports. I hate that. Mm. That is so destructive. We're about, you know, experiences experience this and this thing that you experience now you have a new story mm. you can read your narrative can be whatever you want it to be it can be this thing today it can be something else tomorrow and you are writing your own book all your stories are in the bronze chapter mm. in your own bronze chapter mm. it is our time to write these stories and the more people i can help and the bronze chapter can help collectively we can help people write their own stories that will become lineage and legacy mm. in any small fashion. You become changed. You're changed. That you know, goosebumps. Our, our meeting today will change me. Mm. It will change you. Absolutely. You know, we share. And where we take that tomorrow, who knows? But we might say something. I, I might say something tomorrow to somebody because I talked to you mm. that could change their life mm -hmm. or maybe inspire them to do something they never mm. even thought of doing. And this, you know, it's reciprocal, right? Absolutely. So it's all about what we tell ourselves and what we tell other people. I love that. I, I'm thinking back to my kayaking experience and how what I told myself was, forget black people don't do this. I don't do this, <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. And, but I left that experience being like, yes, I do. Um, and I'm so excited because I get to do it again with you today. That's right. I know you're not kayak certified, but tell me, what are we, what are we gonna do out there on the water? Well, I'm going to get you in a boat. You can see how easy it is to move these boats, to move yourself just by your hand. Mm -hmm. And you can steer yourself with your hand mm -hmm. once you get deep enough. Yeah. It doesn't take much right. to move your boat. Yeah. And if I use both my hands, I can really move my boat. I'm using my, paddling with my hands. All right, here we go. I'll teach you how to hold your paddle. Mm. I'll teach you how to, um, I'll teach you some basic paddle strokes. When you're paddling, remember, kind of swimming. We'll right. swim with the... My swimming is a doggy paddle, so... <laughs> yes, okay. I go forward, I go backward. How to stop, very awesome. important. So now, it's a good thing to know how to stop when you're yeah. going straight, right? Yeah. The way we stop in a kayak is to just be in the paddle always position and we get our push our water. Oh. We just resist the direction. Uh, uh -huh. So you can take a couple strokes, a few strokes, and then stop. It's just relaxing even being... Just sitting here? Yeah. Isn't it? It really is. 
Yeah, talk about extreme adventure. You could just sit here and yeah. just have a beautiful experience. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I want to thank you for today and introducing me to something new. I have a new tool in my tool belt, so. I'm, I'm so grateful <laughs> for the opportunity to share the bronze chapter and share kayaking and share the water and just hang with you. Thank you. <laughs>and Sarah E. Hall. And audio support from Rusty Bogal and Seth Halloran. You can subscribe to Out and Back wherever you listen. And if you like the show, please review us. It helps create excitement around a new show. And if you'd like to support the work we do at CrossCut, go to crosscut.com slash membership. In addition to supporting our journalism, Members receive complete access to on-demand programming from KCTS 9, Seattle's PBS station. For the latest political, environmental, and culture news from the Pacific Northwest, visit crosscut.com. Out and Back is a product of Cascade Public Media. Next time, we're going to finish the season by taking a hike.